Stanford University. It's a pleasure to um, address you as the last speakers today um, with my wonderful wife, Petra Dirkestwan. Uh, she teaches comparative literature and English. I teach and used to teach computer science. And more than once at dinner table, we asked the question, is there life between these two separate disciplines, humanities and engineering? Or are we doomed to stay separate forever? <laughs> so about a year ago, uh, we engaged in a class here at Stanford, a project class, um, trying to bring humanities and, and computer science a bit closer together to see if students would enjoy being exposed to some completely alien world. Uh, the class was um, part of a new program at Stanford. It's called uh, CS Plus X. It's a new joint major between computer science and selected humanities disciplines, specifically to foster interdisciplinary education. And our goal was to bring humanities students together with computer science students. We picked this picture and uh, asked ourselves, um, what is the better color for humanities and for computer science? <laughs> and we agreed quickly that computer science is more muddy and humanities are more pristine. But if you mix both together, um, the muddiness often wins. Uh, that's our class. Um, we attracted 14 students, uh, pretty much 50% computer science and engineering, 50% humanities. And the class was made as a project class. It was made as a class where students get to build something that is at the core using computer science methodology and deep insights in literature. And the driving question of the class was really this idea, how can you use social media and social networks today to engage more people and broader audiences in the love of literature and also literary studies? And one of the first things we did together as a class was actually a literary role play on Twitter. Students were supposed to tweet in character um, for 24 hours. We used the designated hashtag. And we also invited the world to tweet with us. So it's actually not an easy thing to do. You had to be witty, engaging, clever in about 140 characters. <laughs> and one of the things that we found was that in this class, we actually used a different kind of um, novel. We used uh, Frankenstein. But the first kind of role play that I did was back in 2012, and I wanted to share some examples from that, um, from, for the picture of Duran Gray, which is, of course, a very well-known novel that is being studied in hundreds of classrooms all across the world. And it's kind of unpredictable, you know, what happens when you sort of invite the world into the classroom and throw the classroom open like that. But it was really wonderful. Students were very engaged. They were able to use the knowledge um, that they gained in the class about this novel to compose really witty tweets. And there was actually, a, in order to engage enough people in this play, there was actually a twist. If your tweet was good enough, it was clever enough, intelligent enough, Dorian Gray would tweet back. <laughs> so four students and I throughout the day were actually Dorian Gray, and we shared that responsibility. And one of the things that happened was that students were just really, really into it, and the world was too, it turned out. So in this first tweet that you see up there, we actually had a student from our class um, play with this idea of aestheticism and homoeroticism. You know, the picture of Dorian Gray is a 19th century closet novel, and so they knew this, and they used this, uh, this uh, imagery. So here's Dorian Gray tweeting. Spent the longest time in the closet today. Couldn't decide what to wear for the opera tonight. <laughs> there were also some other, shall we say, unintended surprises. This sort of happens when you throw your classroom open to the world. And we quickly actually had people from all over the world try to change our assignment. <laughs> so people were starting, instead of tweeting about the picture of Dorian Gray, they used other characters from other novels, 19th century novels like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde or Great Expectations, to talk to Dorian. <laughs> so here's a tweeter from England, actually, we didn't know her at all, and she brings in Mr. Rochester from Jane Eyre. Now, for those of you who know Jane Eyre, Mr. Rochester also had a little problem in his attic. <laughs> and so Mr. Rochester says, Dorian, my boy, I have a proposition for you. Care to exchange addicts and the responsibilities that lie therein? <laughs> then we also had another sort of really wonderful surprise, which 
I had not planned for, but which I quickly learned was a wonderful sort of side effect of this role play, was that other teachers actually assigned it to their classes. So these, these other students were actually tweeting with us. And here's, here's a very uh, frustrated student tweeting sometime during the role play. I have, to I have to get the fake Dorian to tweet me back for extra credit before the night is over. Ugh, let's see how it goes. <laughs> Overall, the results were amazing. We had hundreds of tweets during the day. Um, results, you know, basically participants from many different countries. Students then brought this back into the classroom, and after we had analyzed the novel and then did the Twitter role play, we were able to see some new ideas and some new sort of um, contents that came out of this discussion on Twitter that we could then bring back to the classroom. As I already mentioned, there was also a wonderful network of teachers all of a sudden that started emailing each other and emailing me and started actually spawning new assignments. So this particular role play actually spawned at least three international adaptations that I know of. I want to share a few of the projects um, from our class, the CS plus X class with you. From reading as a social experience, um, one student team in our class actually took it to creative writing. Um, two students, one an English major and one a symbolic systems major who also had a lot of coding experience, um, were, had this idea of, of um, building a collaborative fan fiction website. And this was not a trivial thing to do. They built a pretty ingenious website where people could submit chapters. This was about another rewriting about another novel, um, Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. So the idea was, the question was, what would happen if people collectively just rewrote Pride and Prejudice today? And so they built the infrastructure for that, and the infrastructure was such that you could actually submit chapters or parts of chapters and build on one another's writing with this. And one chapter I remember specifically was, for example, a feminist and gender-bending rewriting of Eli Bennett. <laughs> so Elizabeth Bennett became Eli Bennett. Another wonderful, hilarious version was actually somebody who had this idea of taking the marriage plot, the marriage and courtship plot of the novel, into the 21st century and have it happen on dating apps and Twitter, <laughs> where Mrs. Bennett advertised her four daughters. <laughs> and this was also conspicuously set at Arayaga University. <laughs> Yet another student was inspired by our CS plus X class to use her coding skills to create an entirely new experiences uh, for readers. Alyssa Van, she allowed me to use her name and her materials. I think she's here today, actually. Yes, right over there, Alyssa, uh, has been building a poem, actually a, a virtual world for a poem. Thank you, Jeremy, <laughs> in the virtual reality lab. So readers can actually put on an Oculus Rift and listen to the voice, to various voices reading this poem as they enter this virtual world that Alyssa has built for the poem. And of course, one of the things that she realized, and I realized as we were talking about this, is that it's already her own interpretation. You know, she's building a world for this poem that is based on her understanding of the poem. The hope is that in the future, other readers might build their own worlds or add their own worlds to this world and kind of have a new connected experience. So in this case, the technology doesn't just enable reading literature or disseminating it, but it completely transforms the experience. When uh, great works are translated from a foreign language into English, I've learned as a computer scientist, it's not precise, but the translator bring in personal biases and experiences and interpretations. And one of the demands uh, of many of the humanities scholars was, uh, perhaps we cannot just look at one translation, but all at the same time. It was a great challenge for computer science students. They developed jointly a website that people can hover over their mouse and ac access a lot of translations and compare them sentence by sentence, a beautiful marriage of computer science and literature. We actually forced the students to launch um, within six weeks. We told them, I didn't quite know it was hard yet because they're all students. So we told them within six weeks, you got to launch and tell all your friends and family and you're going to track on Google Analytics how well you're product is performing, you're going to analyze the strengths and weaknesses, and you're going to relaunch in, in week nine. And every single team did this. So everybody became proficient in using modern uh, tools for understanding how a product in that space performs in, quote unquote, the marketplace. Very new words for most humanities uh, majors. Perhaps the most um, controversial um, idea was to marry uh, the work of great philosophers and the uh, dating app, Tinder. 
I have no clue how our students came up with that idea. <laughs> Certainly not motivated by any of us. But uh, the idea was, um, as I understand it, on Tinder, you get to expose individuals and swipe to the left or right, depending on the level of interest, whatever that means. Um, so the idea was to um, do the same with great philosophical texts, so that if you go in one direction, you go to the next philosopher in another direction, you get uh, more deeply engaged in the writings of that individual. Now, this was controversial. Some of the students said it's really bad to reduce an amazing piece of work to a single page on your phone that you swipe over. The other half of the students said, wake up, it's the 21st century. You're already communicating 140 characters. This is how to get to many people. Neither of us took a position in this discussion, but it really showed what kind of fri friction uh, can, can exist between these disciplines and in these different ages in which these different texts were created. For 125 years, Stanford has been a place where thinking big about learning was not only possible, but desirable. Today, the CS Plus X program is just one of the many ways in which Stanford prepares not just students, but also faculty for the challenges of the 21st century. It's certainly been a great place for us, a literature nerd and an engineer, to try to teach together, even give a talk together without destroying our marriage, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> so today, what we want to leave you with is this, really this belief and this hope that we both have, that it's possible to create, to foster, to educate a new type of engineer, somebody who cares about the imagination, who reads books, who is interested in questions of human value and the changing nature of the human experience and a new type of humanist, somebody who knows what design thinking is, who moves easily between books and screens, between reflecting on things and building things. For that new kind of rich creativity, both of us are very excited, and we think society can only benefit. Thank you. Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.